Hello, everybody. Uh, today we are going to be talking about Hooke's Laws. Uh, my name is James Bruce. I'm filling in for Matt, who unfortunately can't make this session. Um, but I did a degree in physics at Oxford for four years um, before moving into other studies. Uh, and I've been a tutor for goodness knows how long, but uh, approaching seven years myself. Right, let me share our PowerPoint for today and then we'll get cracking. Um, uh, before I do, let me just set up the chat, make sure I can see what everybody's saying. If you have any questions during this presentation, obviously you can ask those as we go along and I'll clarify points uh, if you find them confusing. Um, uh, thank you. Okay, let me just finish setting up and then we'll make a start. Um, I might have to flick back and forth between tabs. Um, can everybody see the uh, PowerPoint? Yes, hopefully. Okie dokie. Right, as promised, uh, today we're talking about Hooke's Law, an elastic potential. Uh, so we study many different types of energy in physics. We're fascinated with energy because number one fact about energy is that it's conserved. Elastic potential energy is one of our many forms of potential energy. That is energy that isn't yet actualized, but is waiting ready to be used to our mechanical advantage if we're clever about the systems we use. By the end of the day, we want to talk about extension and compression. What do those terms mean? And how do they tie into elastic potential energy? Use Hooke's law. First of all, we'll define what is Hooke's law and then use it to relate these uh, extension the extension of a spring of an elastic band to the force that you apply onto it. And then last, we'll define this energy associated with that physical situation, elastic potential energy, and calculate it from Hooke's law. Um, and we'll also look at force extension graphs. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves and into the new stuff, what do we already know? So Newton's three laws. Can anybody tell me uh, any of Newton's three laws? Uh, so let's start perhaps with the first one. Can anybody in the chat fill in what is Newton's first law? Or perhaps Newton's second law? Anybody willing to be brave and volunteer an answer? No? Okay. So Newton's second law, I think students often find, is the easiest, um, because everyone always states it as F equals MA. Force, the force, the resultant force on a moving object is directly proportional to its acceleration. The more force you apply to something, the more it accelerates. Uh, Newton's original statement of his second law actually said that force is equal to the rate of change of momentum, um, which is truer, generally speaking. Um, but for systems where you have constant mass, it ends up simplifying to F equals MA, which is far more friendly. For the purposes of A-level, you don't need calculus. Some of you, if you're doing A-level maths, you'll have met calculus, you'll, have, you'll recognize what these symbols here mean. But for the rest of you, F equals MA would do us just fine. 
Newton's first law then is a little bit of an odd one in the sense that it's really just a specific case of the second law. Newton's first law says if they if you have no resultant force, then you'll be traveling at constant velocity. So if you've got an object that's already moving and it's got no resultant force upon it, i.e. this F in the in Newton's second law is equal to zero, then you'll keep traveling at constant velocity, i.e. the acceleration, the change in velocity will equal zero. So really it's just a specific case of the second law. Um, even more specifically, if that constant velocity that you're traveling at is zero, i.e. your object is stationary, what Newton's first law says is that that object will remain stationary until a resultant force acts on it. Newton's third law then. Can anybody tell me what Newton's third law is? Newton's third law has a famous phrase that often appears. You can go to the YouTube chat and just type in an answer. Any suggestions? Anyone? at all. Okay. Um, Newton's third law, the full statement, if you're doing an exam, your full and most accurate statement is that if an object A exerts a force on an object B, an object B exerts an equal and opposite reaction onto object A. But it's often truncated, often shortened to simply saying that every action as an equal and opposite reaction. That seems fair to us. And this phrase, equal and opposite reaction, crops up all over the place. Okay, so much for Newton's three laws of motion. They're all rules to do with force and how it relates to um, the rate at which things move. But we're talking about energy today, so where does energy come into it? Um, so, um, two types of energy at the bottom that we've met before, kinetic energy, can anybody give me what's the equation for kinetic energy? Hopefully, um, we're familiar with kinetic energy and the other type, so I'd like a formula from one of you watching uh, for kinetic energy. And we also have gravitational potential energy, which on the surface of the Earth approximates to the mass of whatever objects you're lifting up times the acceleration due to gravity, G, which is 9.81 meters per second squared. Times the change in height when you're lifting this object. Half mv squared, thank you. Uh, is that Jai? I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, but thank you for the answer. Exactly right. Kinetic energy, half mv squared. Um, and if I've got a general uh, force exerting on an object and my force is increasing, so I'm applying more and more force as this distance, as I'm moving an object, and the further I move it, the more force I'm applying. The area under the graph here represents the energy that I've transferred to this object that I'm moving. And this is what we call work done in physics. And if the force is constant, i.e. if the line is totally flat, if the force is constant, that implies that the work done, you can imagine if 
this force graph were totally flat, then the work done would just be the area in a rectangle underneath the curve. It would be whatever the level of force is, the height of my rectangle, times the length of my rectangle, the distance traveled. Force times distance traveled. Okay, let's move on to some potentially new stuff. Hooke's law. Right. Um, Hooke's law is we're going to be talking about springs a lot. You'll all have encountered springs, whether they're bed springs or slinkies, the toys that go down the stairs, um, or springs in cars that, ride, that determine the suspension of your car, how comfortable the ride is. And springs compress, you can either push them down and then they want to push back up, or you can extend them and they want to contract and go back in. Um, and so there's two types of forces we can subject our poor little springs to. There's a tensile force and a compressive force. Can somebody tell me what's a tensile force? What does this word tensile mean? A compressive force is a little bit more obvious. I can define that one whilst one, so hopefully somebody can tell me what a tensile force is. Just type it into the chat. A compressive force um, is one that will cause an object to contract in length. Who can tell me what a tensile force is? Uh, whilst we're waiting for an answer, let's have a look at this diagram, mark it up. So we've got three situations, same spring, same purple mass, but three different situations. In number two, um, there's no external force subjected that the spring is subjected to. It's simply a mass. It's been the spring has been glued to the ceiling and a mass is hanging on the other end. In the first, a force that pulls apart. Yes, exactly right. Thank you so much. The answer. Um, so if a compressive force pushes things inwards, like when you're squishing uh, a juice carton or whatever, um, a tensile force will pull things apart. Um, so it will cause an object to expand. Extend. Uh, and increase its length. Okay, so I've got these three situations for my spring. Um, in this one, I'm pushing upwards. In this one, I'm pulling downwards. So these are external forces that me, that I as the laboratory uh, experimenter am running. Um, which of these situations has a tensile force? In it, and which of these has a compressive force? There's a change in length in pictures one and three. Let's have a look. Number three is a tensile force. Number one is a compressive force. Exactly. Thank you so much. Um, because this, of, you know, the change in length is an extension. It's getting longer in image three. And in image one, it's getting shorter. Compressive. Fantastic. Okay. So taking a step to the side, what do I mean by an elastic object? Uh, at A-Level, you do a very short module on material science, um, and you talk about elastic objects, and you talk about plastic 
objects. What's an elastic object? We've all met elastic objects in real life, hopefully. It will return to its original shape. Yes, that's exactly right. That's the definition. Um, it will return to its original shape. Not only can you deform it, uh, not only can you chain, you know, extend and compress, but when you leave it alone, it will come back to its original shape. That's what sets it apart from plastic. Um, because plastic objects, like a carrier bag, you can extend it, but once you've pulled it out, it won't return its original shape. It will stay thin and drawn out. It will return to its original shape once external forces are removed. Hopefully you can all read my writing just fine, but if it is too messy, uh, just let me know. Okay, very good. Hooke's Law then. Um, has anybody met Hooke's Law before? Can anybody give it to me as an equation or perhaps as a sentence? Either or. As with a lot of four, as with a lot of equations in physics, if you can write the equation, you can usually just translate the maths into English and use that as your English definition of the law. Or perhaps, uh, can anybody give me the equation for Hooke's law? F equals kx, force is extension times spring constant. Perfect, perfect, well done. F equals k, delta x. Uh, this, as you rightly said, is a, it's called the spring constant. And as the name implies, it is a constant for a given spring. It might be different for different springs, but uh, this is the extension of your spring. So that's in meters. And this is the force applied. That's in newtons. So what's the unit of the spring constant then? What's the unit of the spring constant? Newtons per meter, exactly. If you can't remember in an exam, you can always use the equation itself to work out what the units are. You can rearrange this. K is force divided by extension. And so the units of K must be the units of F newtons divided by the units of delta X meters. Newtons per meter. Great. Okay, we've got our equation. And then, as I say, once you've got the equation, the verbal definition is normally just a translation from maths straight into English. So Hooke's law states that the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the force applied, i.e. F is directly proportional to delta X. And your constant of proportionality then is K. Okay. Right, calculate the spring constant of a spring that extends by 0 0.2 meters when a force of 15 newtons is applied to it. Does anybody have an answer for this question? If you can leap straight to the answer, I'll be happy. I know it can be a little bit annoying typing out your working on 
YouTube, on Zoom, or any chat box, really. Who's got an answer for me? Seventy-five. Um, so let me just check that. Um, Fifteen newtons divided by zero point two. Uh, this is why I wish I had my calculator to hand um, because I'm lazy. Uh, but zero point two is one fifth, um, and so I can um, just say this is fifteen times five. Is that? Uh, and that's seventy five. Um, because 10 times 15 is 150, divide it by, nice, 75 newtons per meter. Great. Okay, how is everybody feeling? Um, type in a one if you're feeling totally straightforward, number two if you're less sure, and number three if this is just not making any sense. Is everybody on a one, two, three? Any case? Okay, number one. Good, good. If you do get confused, um, do feel free to uh, just type in questions into the chat. I'm more than happy to take questions. Speaking of questions, let's have a go at one or two exam questions. Um, right, you're given a spring, a meter rule, and a 100 gram mass, describe how you would determine the force constant K of the spring. Oh, this sounds like one of those horrible long questions that involves lots of words rather than calculations. Students often hate these types of questions, so don't feel bad if this makes you oh, sag inside. But don't worry, this is only three marks. You can get questions up to six marks. Um, right, does anybody have any ideas for first steps if I'm doing this as an experiment? How can I determine the spring constant? Got my spring. A ruler. And a 100 gram mass or a mass that is labeled as 100 grams. F equals MA, okay. That seems like it could come in useful. Specifically, F equals MA, a specific example of F equals MA is W equals MG when you're talking about gravity. The weight of an object i.e. the external force that's that it's that is applied to it by gravity is equal to its mass times its acceleration due to gravity measure the difference between the equilibrium point and the point of greatest extension okay so first of all let's measure we want to measure the difference between two states of this spring that is exactly right. To start off with though, um, these questions, they like you to think fairly practically. Just start off by saying, well, let's measure the spring when it's, um, um, uh, when it's unextended. So measure the natural length of the spring is a good place to start. So measure the natural length of the spring. Step two, um, hang the mass off the spring. That will make it extend. And we want to measure extended length. OK. Um, Joe is saying F time uh, divided by delta X. Okay, so where what F are we using? We're told this is 100 grams. So 
So k is f divided by delta x. We've got the delta x, we've measured it. How do I calculate this F? Ah, Jai's already told me before. She said it's the mass 0 0.1 kg times 9.8. Okay, good. But, um, I agree. Uh, all in all, a good answer. Um, so, M G divided by your um, your first measurement, it's sort of the extended one minus the natural length. Good. If it were a longer question, you might perhaps proffer some suggestions for avoiding errors. Um, you are always likely to be asked at least one or two questions per exam on what sort of errors crop up in experiments to so get used to thinking in that way. But let's move on. Atoms in a solid are held in position by electrical forces. These electrical forces can be represented by an imaginary interatomic spring between neighboring atoms. The interatomic spring obeys Hooke's law and has a force constant, just as a normal spring in the laboratory. Researchers in America have recently managed to determine the force. Uh, experienced by an individual atom of cobalt when the atoms were squeezed together. The researchers found that the force of 210 piconewtons changed the separation between a pair of atoms by a distance of 0.16 nanometers. Okay, state Hooke's law. Uh, can anybody remember, can anyone give me a statement of Hooke's law? If uh, a question says state, then they're looking for a verbal answer. You can start with the equation. You can start but as a way to remind yourself, well, it's f equals k delta x. But who can give me uh, a definition in words for Hooke's law? Whilst I'm waiting for that, I'll just set up the second question. The extension of an object is directly proportional to the force applied to the object. Yes. Um, the, extension, the extension or compression, um, if we're feeling very pedantic about it, we can say extension or compression of a spring is proportional to the force applied. Fab. They've given you these two numbers. I've underlined them. I always suggest when you're doing exam questions that as you're reading, you do highlight the numbers because they're nearly always bound to come in useful. Um, we've got we've got Hooke's law. We've been told it obeys Hooke's law. Um, can we work out this uh, extension? Well, they, they give us a force. They tell us the extension. So yes, we can. The only potential difficulty is this P. Um, what, and it's piconewtons. What is a piconewton? It's 210 times 10 to the what? 10 to the minus. And the same question goes for nano. 10 to the minus 12, exactly. And what about nano? Uh, ooh. So pico, yeah, okay, okay. Pico is 10 to the minus 12. Uh, 
10 to the minus 9, exactly, exactly. Good. Uh, if you plug that into your calculator, uh, when I did this earlier, I think I got 1.3125 newtons per meter. You can check that on your calculator. Uh, we're given we're given data really only to two significant figures. Let's return the favor. That's 1.3 newtons per meter to two significant figures. Okay. Hopefully that's all within, within our understanding. Let's move on to upthrust and Archimedes principle. This is quite exciting. This never used to be officially on the physics course, um, which made doing Olympiads a little bit tricky. Uh, but I think it's a really fun and interesting little, um, little nugget of physics. Okay, um, a force extension graph. Um, more or less does what it says on the tin. Uh, physicists are not the most creative people in the world when it comes to naming things. A force extension graph shows precisely that. It shows force and it shows extension. What more could you possibly want? So it shows the force required. to attain a certain level of extension. So if um, I wanted to know how much force do I need for this particular object that we're graphing for, how much force do I need to apply to achieve, um, I don't know, 10 centimeters of extension, I could find 10 centimeters, draw a line up where it meets, draw a line across, and I could say, ah, I'm going to need, I don't know, 20 Newtons. Balls required to attain a certain extension. Okay, so generally, the steeper this graph, so if I've got a different object, and it's got a steeper line, that means for a given force, so if I, if I applied 20 Newtons to this object, Oh, it looks like I'd only be getting about four centimetres or, or roughly four centimetres of extension. And so this is, uh, in some senses, a tougher object. It's a stronger material, harder to stretch. Conversely, if I have something with a very, very shallow force extension graph, well, uh, it's so shallow that 20 newtons is all the way over here. Looks like you'd be getting, you know, half a meter or so of extension. Um, and so this is easy to stretch. Easy to extend. Okay. The work done extending or compressing a spring is given by a certain property of these graphs. How can I work out using, let's go back to just thinking about this black line. How can I work out the work done to extend my spring? What feature of that graph will tell me? Work done, 0 0.5 times, eight. yes, exactly. So you've given me um, the formula half That's delta x, which is looking oddly familiar. It's half a number times another number, which is the area of a triangle, which makes sense because the work done is equal to the area underneath your curve. Okay, so if I want to know how much energy do I need to put in in order to extend my object by 10 centimeters, it's the area under here. Of course, if I wanted to extend my object to 20 centimeters, so over here, that I'd need to put in this other uh, area amount of work as well. So it's going to require even more work. So the area. Oh. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. 
Right. So, work done. Form of energy. Work done is transfer of energy, usually uh, via some sort of kinetic energy. Um, we can work done rears its head up all over physics. So once we're now talking about energy, we can start to talk about potential energy and specifically elastic potential energy. Who can give me a definition of elastic potential energy? So it's, it's going to be some sort of energy stored. So it's the energy stored in an object. That's, that's what the potential part means. Um, but in what situation is this energy going to be stored? Is there a way we can work out an equation for the elastic potential energy? Any ideas? So we know that to achieve a certain extension, we need to put in a certain amount of work into our spring, you know, putting it apart. Great. But energy, the fascinating thing about energy and the reason we as physicists are so obsessed with energy is the fact that it's conserved. If I have to put in energy in order to achieve a certain extension, that energy cannot simply disappear. I can't destroy it. It has to go somewhere. And yes, some of it will be dissipated as heat, but hopefully the majority of it will be stored somehow in the spring itself. That's where elastic potential energy comes in. It's the energy stored in an object when it is ex uh, extended or compressed. Okay, so we can, we can define, um, when my object is totally unstretched, it has zero elastic potential energy. And then I'm going to do some work to deform it somehow, either extending it or compressing it. So any work done onto this object will be converted into elastic potential energy, EPE for short. So it's the work done to extend or compress. And Jai told me that this work done was the area under my force extension graph, which is half F delta X. Okay, so that, that is the perfectly legitimate formula for elastic potential energy. However, if we want to get rid of the force aspect of it, we can remember, ah, hang on, we have an expression for the force on a spring. It's equal to K delta X. If I substitute that into my equation, I end up with elastic potential energy is one half K delta X all squared. Okay. So a quick, slightly rough and ready derivation but this equation holds true generally. The elastic potential energy is half K delta X squared. So when a spring with a spring constant of 50 newtons per meter is extended by three meters, what's the elastic potential energy? Can somebody beat me to the answer? I'll slowly write my working outs. Ideally, somebody will leap in there. Tell me what the answer is first. Two hundred and twenty five. Yes, exact amount. Great. Two hundred and twenty five. 
Great. Okay. So, <laughs> um, slightly comic image of a student uh, flicking an elastic band. I don't know if anybody's ever tried this trick. It's mildly amusing, um, but often distracting from lessons. So don't be, don't be surprised if your teacher tells you off for flicking elastic bands in, in class. Um, but despite its slightly um, disruptive nature, uh, it's also a good demonstration of elastic potential energy in action. So I've got an elastic band unextended, has no elastic potential energy at this point. I then pull it apart. I'm doing work to do that because there's a force that I have to work against when I'm pulling that band back. It's got this elastic potential energy. I release it. And suddenly, all that elastic potential energy is released. And what sort of energy is it released as? It's kinetic energy. Fantastic. So as I put it back, the band gains elastic potential energy um, as I do work against the elastic force. So the EPE, elastic potential energy, is converted. into, well, part, again, there'll always be a little bit of waste energy. It's converted partially into sound, a bit of heat as well. If you ever play with an elastic band and pull it backwards and forwards, you'll notice that the rubber band gets hot. Um, the famous and very charismatic physis physicist of the 20th century, Richard Feynman, he did a series with the BBC called Fun to Imagine. You can find it on YouTube. It's worth watching his, it's just three minutes of him talking about elastic bands, but he's such a charming man. Um, if he gets so excited about it, you should, um, you should check it out. But he talks about the, um, the way that thermal energy is related to um, the elastic potential energy in a rubber band. It's very fun. Anyway, slightly off topic. Uh, so elastic potential energy is converted, sorry, that's not written very well, converted into kinetic energy. Okay. Um, my second example, I've got my spring. Um, I've got a spring and it's got a, a little platform on it, this purple platform. Um, and then uh, it's going to travel downwards. So I'll continue this line just for reference. It's going to move downwards a certain little way. Um, so it's to uh, at the start, it's got this little tray and then I'm going to put a little weight on it um, and it sinks down. Um, so what are the potential energies? What's the, what's the energy transfer that's occurring here? Clearly there's some elastic potential. Uh, here it's being extended, so you'd expect your elastic potential energy to be at a maximum when it's maximally stretched. But what's the other type of energy that's at play here? So the EPE is at a minimum when it's totally unstretched. What's the other type of energy that's going on in this bottom left picture? In both cases, my platform is stationary. This is the picture after it's stabilized.
Gravitational potential energy. Sorry, I've only just checked the chat. Perfect. So when it's at its natural energy, um, its gravitational potential energy is at a max. Um, so there's lots of gravitational potential energy, GPE, gravitational potential energy. But no elastic. When it's at this lower position, so when it's extended, it's the reverse. It's lost height, sad, <laughs> which means that its gravitational potential energy is in a minimum. Um, so it's lost energy equal to whatever the mass was times this delta x, mg delta x. And if nothing is lost, that will hopefully be equal to the elastic potential energy. Um, which is half k delta x squared. And you could have quite a fun exam question along those lines. So when extended, the GPE has been transferred into EPE, just like a bungee jumper. Bungee jumper standing at the top of the bridge. He's got loads of gravitational potential energy because he's up high. Uh, no elastic potential because your bungee cord is not stretched. Then once you jump, you suddenly lose loads of gravitational potential energy. It's converted into kinetic energy as an intermediate stage. And then the band extends and all that kinetic energy is converted into elastic potential energy. Um, and then the reverse process goes on. How are we feeling? Um, one, two, three. Um, hopefully nobody ever goes higher than three. But if you're really feeling that confused, feel free to improvise a new number. Give me a little rating. How are we feeling? If you've got any questions, do just ask. That's no problem whatsoever. Is everybody clear? Nobody gives an answer. I'll assume everybody's fine. Everybody's just so shocked by the beauty of the physics that they'll that they can't they can't bring themselves to interrupt it. <laughs> right, let's move on then. Uh, we've got a few more exam questions just to test our understanding, and then we can move on. There's another session immediately after this, but that's on uh that's native to snap revise not live streamed on youtube i'm afraid um state hooks law okay well somebody's already answered this earlier so i, I won't ask uh, ask you to type it in again but the extension of a spring is directly proportional to the force applied to it. Okay. We're then told about this, um, this spring. Uh, thank you, Claudio. Sorry, I've only just seen your rating one. You're on board, you understand. A spring is compressed by applying a force. Figure 6.1 shows the variation of the force F with compression X. So it's a force extension graph. Oh, it's always it's nearly always worth actually dedicating a bit of time to looking at the labels, not because force and extension are surprising, but because there's these millimeters. That trips up so many students 
Um, it's a bit, and it's a really easy uh, mistake to avoid. Just check whether it's in millimeters or nanometers or anything sneaky. Calculate the spring constant. Okay. Well, F. Hello, can people hear me, see me? Hello? Right, hopefully people can now see me again. Um, apologies. I um yeah, my internet seemed to have gone gone squishy for, for a bit there. Um Jay said the uh, spring constant is the gradient of the graph. Yeah, you could work it out as the gradient of the graph perfectly happily. You can also just pick a convenient point uh, and simply say, look, I've got a pair of coordinates there. Let's work it out. Mathematically, these two steps will be identical. So the end point of the graph is pretty convenient. Um, that is 125 newtons up here and 50 millimeters down here 125 divided by 50 millimeters 50 times 10 to the minus 3 gives me 2500 newtons per meter but, okay thank you thank you for your responses i am back uh, <laughs> show that the work done in compressing the spring by 48 millimeters. So this is actually a graph of compression rather than extension. Uh, is 2.9 joules. Where can I find the work done on this graph? And how can I show it? So 48 millimeters is right next to the line I previously drew. Let's try and do my best using a graphics tablet, but I'm sure you can do a better job on pieces of paper in your exam. How can I work out the work done? 
is the area underneath it. So we can use half K, um, half K F, uh, a half, sorry, half K delta X squared or half F times X. The area here is a nice triangle. It's a nice geometric shape. So we don't need to count the squares, which sometimes you do. Um, and that always makes it feel like you're going back to primary school a little bit. But here we've been saved. Um, the force is 120. The width is 48 millimeters. Again, remembering that it's millimeters. And I think when I put that into my calculator earlier, I got 2.88 joules, um, which we can round to 2.9 joules to two significant figures. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Um, final slide. Figure 6.2 shows the spring in a toy gun. The springs used to fire a dart of mass 15 grams vertically. The spring is compressed by 48 millimeters. When the gun is fired, uh, the strain energy in the spring is converted into the kinetic energy of the dart. Calculate the speed with which the dart initially leaves the spring when the gun's fired. Okay. Um, how's best, how is it best to set up this question? We're told the compression, we're told the mass, 15. Uh, this is all part of the same question, by the way. Um, it's the same spring. And so 48 millimetres is convenient, as that's what we have just used. So we know that the work done to compress it was 2.88 joules. How is that going to be useful? Find the elastic potential energy from the spring that's converted into the kinetic energy. Great. And the equation for kinetic energy, as I was told earlier, is half mv squared. Fab. OK. Um, rearrange your equation then. Um, so v is the square root of 2 times this energy. Uh, I'm going to have to wrap up soon. Um, I'm sorry we lost time because of my internet. Um, but we've got another class starting shortly. The answer I got was 19.5959 repeat blah, 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 meters per second, which is roughly 20 meters per second. This last bit's interesting. Give two reasons why the dart is unlikely to actually have 2.9 joules of gravitational potential energy when it gets to the top. Well, there are waste energies. Can anybody tell me a source of waste energy? energy is lost as heat energy to friction is classic yes uh, friction and air resistance um you or you could separate those out um, but perhaps sound, um, any of those will do, your classic sources of heat, of um, energy lost. Right, you should now be able to tell me what extension and compression are, use Hooke's laws, define Hooke's laws, relate them to extension force, and then relate them also to extension compression, force extension graphs, um, and talk about elastic potential energy. Um, sorry I had to rush the last bit of that lesson. Does anybody have any questions? Um, otherwise, uh, I hope everybody has a great Christmas, a great rest of their day, uh, and hopefully I'll see you all soon.
Goodbye.